Yes, okay. <clears throat> yeah, sorry, I had to take a break as my son was putting on some loud music <laughs> and I'm on loudspeaker right now. So. Um, okay, so it's a pleasure to introduce <clears throat> someone who needs no introduction. Evan Krogan, professor at UCSF and um, director of the QBI Institute. And so Nevan sent us a quite uh, enticing title called TBD, which perhaps stands for a mysterious um, <laughs> viral drug that he's going to tell us about. <laughs> okay, great, hey, thanks. Uh, so I'm gonna um, give an update on uh, the QCRG, which was alluded to yesterday, the QBI coronavirus um, research group, and in particular a paper that's gonna be coming out tomorrow uh, in, in science, as you can see, a very highly collaborative paper involving many authors um, in many different places. And uh, this was, again, a great collaboration with the Pasteur Institute, in particular, uh, Marco Vignuzzi and Veronica. And I'll show you their data here um, shortly. And this is um, connected to two previous papers that have been recently published, again, in great collaborations with the Pasteur Institute with a number of uh, groups at the Pasteur. Uh, the Nature paper, this protein-protein interaction analysis that Reed had talked about uh, yesterday, and then a global phosphorylation analysis that Danielle Sweeney is going to be talking about um, later uh, today. And obviously, we've been working closely with the Institut Pasteur, uh, but we've also been collaborating with many other groups um, around the world, both academic and in industry uh, setting uh, as well. And this is one of the, I think, the great silver linings of this pandemic, is to see all these great collaborators come together. Uh, in, I would argue, in a very unprecedented um, uh, way. And here's just a map of um, the collaborators that have been involved in those three papers that I showed. I'll be discussing one in more detail, mostly in the United States and in Europe. Uh, and I just want to show one, one other thing on this map. When we initially um, uh, cloned out all the genes for SARS-CoV-2, we did it very quickly. This was led by David Gordon. We had them all synthesized, and we just tweeted we had all these constructs. And we just said, anybody want them, we'll send them for free, no strings attached, um, please feel free to distribute. And we were able to distribute um, those plasmids, those sets of, that set of plasmids to almost 400 labs in over 40 countries in really in a matter of weeks. And, and uh, I think that's great that we're able to distribute these reagents to help expedite research on uh, SARS-CoV-2. So here is the protein-protein interaction map uh, that we had published in collaboration with the Pasteur Institute um, a couple of months ago, just to say that we had identified 69 different drugs and, and, and compounds, and we tested um, them with respect to their antiviral efficacy and cellular toxicity, both in collaboration with um, scientists in Paris and New York. This led us to a number of drugs and compounds that we're uh, looking at in more detail, as are others. Two translation inhibitors here, pledepsin and apladin, and then uh, zotadafin, and we're also very interested in these sigma R1 uh, modulators. It's a receptor that we found in our protein-protein interaction map. And a few months ago, there was a piece in Nature Biotechnology where there's actually 13 drugs they've reported that are being tested for COVID-19 in clinical trials based on this protein-protein uh, interaction map. And actually, there's been several more as well that we're monitoring. So obviously we're dealing here with SARS-CoV-2, but as everyone knows, since the turn of the century, there's been a couple of other uh, problematic coronaviruses, including SARS-CoV-1 and MERS. Uh, so the challenge here, I think, is maybe we can look backwards. Let's study these two other viruses to be more predictive when SARS-CoV-3 hits and it's coming. We all know it's coming. So maybe looking across all these coronaviruses with some of our tools, we would be in a better position when we ultimately have to deal with SARS-CoV-3. So uh, this is what this paper uh, is uh, based upon. We generated a SARS-CoV-1 human protein-protein interaction map, similar to what we had done for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, similarly, uh, a map here with uh, uh, focused on the MERS proteins. Uh, there's about 25 proteins in each one of these viruses. This was work um, uh, done by Dave Gordon and Medi did these beautiful networks. And one of the ways that you can just simply look at this data is by clustering it across the three viruses. So there's some really cool comparisons you can do. This is one very simple way to do it. And you can see about a fifth of the interactions are shared here. This is cluster two between SARS-1, SARS-2, and MERS. About a quarter of them, you just see them as SARS-1 and SARS-2. And then about a fifth of them, you see specific to MERS. So there's different ways you can look at this data. This is one representation I wanna show you where we're specifically comparing the SARS-1, SARS-2 interactions as a group compared to MERS. 
So SARS-1 and SARS-2 are actually quite similar. And what we've done here is this differential uh, scoring system, which I won't go into, but what I'll tell you is that we're comparing these three clusters. So in this particular map, um, if the interactions are shared by all three virus, the edge is black. If it's MERS specific, it's blue. And if it's SARS-1, SARS-2 specific, it's red. And just to zoom up on a couple of cases, uh, just to illustrate some of these uh, types of interactions, we, see, we find NSP6 interacting with Sigma R1 in SARS-1 and SARS-2, but not MERS. With the N protein, we find it um, associated with case and counties 2 and all three viruses. These are black edges. Um, uh, Danielle's going to talk a little bit more about that set of kinases uh, later. And then we also find black edges here with proteins involved in RNA processing. This is why we think some of these drugs are going to be pan coronavirus, some of these translation inhibitors. And then NSP14, uh, Kayvon talked about this yesterday with a different connection. Uh, we actually find a number of blue edges. These are um, specific uh, connections that you only see with MERS NSP14 and not SARS-1 and SARS-2. So the, the, these maps are very rich and you can look at them a number of different ways and, and obviously they're generating a lot of hypotheses that we and others will be testing. We also took the opportunity that we had all these clones uh, to localize them in the cell, to see where in the cell they were uh, using microscopy. And this was done in collaboration with Andrew and Massimo and uh, Robert. Um, so we just translate transfect in each one of the tag proteins and looked at the strep tag to see where they're localizing. Um, the Mos Mosimo polymeri lab in Scotland actually made antibodies against 14 of the SARS-CoV-2 proteins. So in collaboration with Robert Gross, we could actually see in infected cells where they're localizing to as well. So this is a great resource. We have these 14 different antibodies that we'll be um, uh, distributing. And we have uh, a number of images here um, based on transient transfection of the individual proteins as well as using the antibodies. There's a ton of data here associated with this analysis. And I think these images and the data derived from it are gonna be a great resource for the scientific community. This is a summary of the localization of all the proteins from SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-1, and MERS. This is from the transient transfections. And then what I'm overlaying on top is the localization that was generated from the antibodies in infected cells. Okay, so there's some correlation and there's some where they're not correlated. I just wanna highlight one particular connection here. It's between ORF9B and it's being localized to the mitochondria here in SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2 with the transient transfection and with the antibody. And just, this is the, the localization you can see using the antibody in infected cells that ORF9B is uh, very nicely um, localizing to the mitochondria. And I'll come back to that uh, particular protein in just a minute. So in collaboration with Marco and Veronica at the Pasteur, we took the uh, 332 originally interacting proteins for SARS-CoV-2, did an RNAi knockdown in A549 cells expressing ACE2. This was a line um, created at the Pasteur, um, and then looked by RTQPCR to see what effects it has on infection. Uh, in parallel, we collaborated with the company Synthigo. They did CRISPR knockouts in CACO2 cells one at a time. And with Chris Bassler in Atlanta, he did infection studies and saw what effects they had on um, uh, infection when you deleted each one of these genes. So we had two different um, cell types, uh, two different assays, uh, two different uh, genetic perturbation strategies, and two different continents. And this allowed us to, for, uh, to generate this data. This is a comparison of the two. In red here are were knockouts in CACO2 cells that have an effect. In yellow are, are um, or sorry, this is A549 in red. In yellow, it's um, knocked down in uh, CACO2. And in orange are where we see an overlap. So there's some differences. Uh, there's some similarities. But in total, out of the 332, genetically, at least one of these cell types, we found that 73 of these genes had an effect um, on uh, infection. And many of these are actually druggable targets. And here's a summary of those um, 73. And now overlaying on the protein-protein interactions from um, SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-1, and MERS. And I just want to end this morning by talking about one particular connection here. There's a big node, a big red node there on that map. To, so one connection here between TOM70 and ORF9B. So I showed you that ORF9B is localized uh, to the mitochondrial. TOM70 is a mitochondrial protein. Uh, this is showing that we found the interaction both with SARS-CoV-2 and um, SARS-CoV-1. Uh, and we wanted to look at this in more detail. And one of the um, subgroups of the QCRG, the Structural Biology Consortium, which is being led by Oren Rosenberg and Clem Verba. Oren's talking later today about some beautiful structural work on tuberculosis. But they had put together this group of 60 scientists, uh, 60 trainees mostly, students, postdocs, technicians from 18 different labs. And they set up this beautiful pipeline 
for structural characterization of these SARS-CoV-2 human protein-protein interactions. And they obtained a three angstrom structure using cryo-EM of TOM70 binding to, it's about, I think about half of uh, ORF9B, which is an orange here, and it's tucked up in the active site. And TOM70 is involved in um, uh, chaperoning proteins in and out of the mitochondria. So for some reason here, ORF9B has hijacked this to chaperone itself or to chaperone other proteins that's beneficial for the virus. We're still looking into that. Um, the interaction uh, is mostly hydrophobic, uh, hydrophobic with 13, 36 out of the 38 residues interacting with TOM70. And what's also very cool here is when we look at our phosphorylation data from the previous paper, we find that two sites on ORF9B are highly phosphorylated, S50 and S53. And the idea here is that if ORF9B is phosphorylated, there's no way it could be binding to TOM70. So we think that those phosphorylation sites are, are interrupting the interaction. I just want to end with this video here, which I think is very cool, and it illustrates how these viral proteins can behave so differently. This is ORF9B by itself in a dimer, and it primarily, you can see it has these uh, beta sheets, but when um, a single one of these proteins binds to TOM70, it adopts an alpha helices structure. So it's very cool in my mind to see how these proteins can change so dramatically at a biophysical and biochemical and a structural level, um, if it's by itself or it's binding to um, a human proteins. And I think this is, could be one of the reasons why this set of viral proteins is so problematic because they can adopt many different shapes, each one of these proteins, and have a wreak much bigger havoc in the cell during the course of infection. So the group here is uh, structurally characterizing a number of, of other of these interactions, ones that we've validated genetically. And I think this is just such a great example because you've combined the proteomics, the cell biology, the microscopy, the genetics, the structural biology, the biochemistry all together uh, in a very highly collaborative way to study what we think is the key interaction here with respect to SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV-1 and presumably with SARS-CoV-3 when we have to deal with that. And we're looking now to see if this has any therapeutic value, this particular structure. So I'll just end there. And obviously, uh, a lot of people have been involved in this work. This is just a picture of my lab. Just a few people I want to highlight here. Uh, Dave uh, Gordon, who's led a lot of the protein-protein interaction studies. Uh, Mehdi, who led the phosphorylation work, which I briefly alluded to, which Daniel, Danielle here will go into more detail. And I also want to highlight Ruth Uttenhain and Robin Cake. Uh, Robin, Ruth, and Danielle lead a lot of our mass spectrometry work that we do uh, in the group. So thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. <clears throat> Thanks for a great talk. So we can move to the questions and answers. First question is from Sherry Mukherjee. She's asking whether structures of TOM70 with other host proteins are available. And is this groove that you mentioned used by other proteins? Yeah, this uh, Oren is on this call. I can get him to chime in as well. I know that um, uh, HSP90 uh, is bound to TOM70 and there's some work ongoing right now with the QCRG structural group showing how HS, the HSP protein is how it's competing with binding to TOM70 when ORF9B um, is around. That was a structure, TOM70, that was work that was uh, led by Dave Agard. He's had that structure for many years and just by serendipity, um, ORF9B bound to this and then we were able to work with him along with Clem and Oren to structurally characterize that connection. I don't know, I heard Oren saying something. Did you wanna add something there? I was just going to say that there, there's, this is the first structure of TOM70 bound to any substrate in its uh, substrate binding pocket. There was prior work uh, showing how it interacts with HSP90 through a small peptide. But this structure once again proves that uh, pathogens know how to, how to get uh, into these host pathogen interactions in a really uh, tight binding way. And, uh, and they just exploit the native states of, uh, of TOM70 to be able to interrupt the function. Okay, so <clears throat> we got another question here from, I'm not sure from whom, does SOF9B affect TOM70 function? Yeah, that's a good question. We're looking into that now. Um, I will say in infected cells, I didn't show this, ORF9B co-localizes with TOM70, giving us more credence that there's a connection um, that's valid in infected cells. Um, overexpression of ORF9B, we have data suggesting that it is resulting in some mislocalization of um, uh, TOM70. Um, but right now, let's just say a work is ongoing to determine what is the molecular mechanism of ORF9B binding to TOM70. Why is it? It's clearly 
your move Tom 70 infection is being decreased, but why? So there's a lot of ongoing work right now to, to, to flesh that out. Another question from your standing out. How do the mitochondria look like? Yeah, that's, I mean, actually, uh, Oren was asking me for some strains yesterday to do some um, tomography work um, in infected cells and after expressing ORF9B and after deleting TOM70 and then deleting TOM70 and then infecting it. So uh, again, this is ongoing work that I think is going to be led by Oren and some of the others in the QCRG. Mm -hmm. Okay, then Felix is asking um, if you show the structure of the intact or 9B or just a fragment. Uh, it's about half of the protein of ORF 9B that we that we found a, a structure for. It, it's all there. It's just not ordered. We only see the part that's bound to Tom 70. Yeah, that, last question: You showed this immunolabeling. Um, did you look at the co-localization of the different proteins in, in the imaging data? Yeah, there was. Um, uh, Robert Gross did uh, a number of co-localizations um, with each one of the antibodies and um, the transient transfections, as did, as did Andrew, to more accurately determine where each one of these proteins um, is being localized in the cell. And again, just to reiterate, we're talking about ORF9B. We found ORF9B co-localizing very beautifully, I should have shown that image, with TOM70 um, at the mitochondria. Okay. Okay. Th thanks a lot, Nivan. I think it's time to move to the next speaker, Martin Foss from the Pasteur Institute. He's heading the nanoimaging core facility, and he's going to tell us about uh, cryo EM at the, at the Pasteur Institute. Melanie Otto is professor at UCSF and director of the Gladstone Institute of Virology, and she's going to tell us about viral infections of human organoids. Please, Melanie. You're currently muted. Um, okay, so I'm unmuted. Okay, super. Let's start again. Thank you very much, Christophe. Delighted to be here. Um, hopefully next time in person in Paris. We can't wait to come and travel over. I want to continue our dialogue that we started in San Francisco on um, human organoids and viral infections. Like many of you, we have um, shifted part of our effort to study SARS-CoV-2. Um, and organoids are really a perfect resource for collaborations. Um, we support work at the QC, QCRG that Nevin um, introduced this morning um, in lung organoids and also in, um, in cell lines. But we also work on intestinal organoids and, um, and heart cells. And, um, and um, we use um, double-stranded RNA mostly as our outread in these, um, in these studies by microscopy. You can see here on the bottom panel the infection um, in green. Um, uh, in, the, in the lung cells and the intestinal cells and in red here in the cardiomyocytes. And interestingly, the cardiomyocytes really react very sensitively to um, infection by SARS-CoV-2 with extensive damage. Um, and we're very interested in, in finding out more. We also have an, a long-standing interest in, in the lab together with Jennifer Doudna and, and um, Dan Fletcher at Berkeley um, to use CRISPR diagnostics. So we use Cas13A as a direct RNA detecting enzyme we're not amplifying, and we're using um, um, a cell phone or mobile phone as a, as a direct outread. And with this mobile platform, we can really um, detect um, a wide range of, um, of patient samples um, down to sensitivities of um, 100 copies per microliter. But um, um, SARS-CoV-2 is not the only virus. We continue to, wor to work on others. And um, um, like Jennifer's beautiful Nobel Prize last year, last week, um, the Nobel Committee also highlighted um, hepatitis C research, which was a very, uh, which is a very strong um, um, interest in the lab since a long time. And we know that um, Hep C remains an issue despite very effective anti, uh, um, uh, direct act acting antivirals. We still have a lot of people infected. A large percentage of the world's liver cancers are caused by hepatitis C and there's still no vaccine. So the progressive, the damage that we see with um, <clears throat> Um, over the time in patients um, inspired us to, to, to look into stem cells and to see whether they could contribute um, to this continuous um, damage. 
we turn to um, Hans Klever's adult stem cell derived organoid technology, um, where you use um, stem cells isolated from adult livers um, and then grow um, cell uh, organoids and culture. We used non-infected and HCV infected um, donors, HCV infected that were viremic at the time. And to our surprise, we found that a large proportion of these organoids carried forward the infection. And this was independently of the genotype. Um, so this really indicated that the stem cells in the patients that we used to generate these organoids were infected to begin with, but also that these organoids, stem cell organoids in culture provided a favorable environment. To see what, whether we could also infect them ex vivo, we used the organoid from HCV2 or uh, uh, organoids from HCV infected patients that did not uh, carry forward infection and infected them with their own virus um, that we got from the serum. And, um, and found that indeed these organ these stem cell like organoids were very easy, were very readily infectable, robustly infectable with the autologous virus, better though than if we differentiated these organoids from the stem cell state into a hepatocyte like state. Morphologically, uh, phenotypically, these organoids did not look very much different, whether they carried HCV or not. We know the virus is not uh, in any way cytotoxic, um, and we could see this that e either in the stem cell state or when we differentiate them, um, they look pretty similar whether there's HCV in there or not. So we turn to single cell RNA-seq to see whether there are some more subtle changes um, between the infected and the uninfected populations in the organoids. Um, we had to um, use a five prime virus inclusive single cell RNA-seq approach because the virus is non polyadenylated So we included in hep C specific or, um, oligo. And we looked at um, one of the donors, HCV1 organoids in the stem cell state or while it was differentiating um, into hepatocyte-like cells. We find very nice clustering, um, and um, these cluster not only clustered um, based on the developmental stage or differentiation stage, they also clustered based on viral infection. You can see that the virus is uh, mainly um, virally infected cells clustered in, in, in cluster four, eight, and nine. When we compare these clusters to the other clusters, um, we can see that they have a very unique differentiation um, and transcriptional profile. Um, it looks as if these stem cells are pushed uh, prematurely into a, into a hepatocyte-like state. Um, these bipotent stem cells can also go into col cholangiocytes, and we see that the infected cells primarily are pushed into a hepatocytic fate. Stem cell markers are uncharacteristically downregulated in these um, in these organoids, while they are maintained in, in the in the uninfected ones, with the exception of OCT4, which is actually a very odd uh, marker here because it's usually very lowly expressed in differentiating liver um, hepatocyte-like cells. OCT4 is of course the master uh, regulator of pluripotent stem cell, but is also a cancer stem cell marker. So we think that these uh, that the viral infection locks the um, stem cells into a premature hepatocyte-like state with potential cancer stem cell features. An important um, obvious thing to look for was the interferon response in there. These um, infected cells really have completely blunted the interferon response, while the interferon response is robustly induced in the, um, in the um, uninfected bystander stem cells, really indicating that HCV needs to um, 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 deal with the interferon response in a very direct way in order to survive in cells. We compared our data of the single cell RNA-seq with a protein-protein interactome that we had done with Nevin's group earlier and Mehdi and his group made this beautiful network propagation where we saw immediately that three pathways were multiply intersected by, um, uh, by hepatitis C. This is splicing or RNA uh, processing, ribosome biogenesis or mitochondrial transport and uh, oxidative phosphorylation. We see splicing is upregulated in these infected cells and multiple intersected by, um, uh, by some of the um, HCV proteins, while ribosome biogenesis and um, uh, oxidative phosphorylation or mitochondrial transport was downregulated in these infected cells, really highlighting that there is perturbation of the gene expression, um, uh, um, abnormal differentiation, but also potentially a shift into a pro-cancerogenic uh, uh, state in these cells. So, 
my first conclusion is that HCV replicates and persists in liver stem cells and perturbs the gene expression in these cells and skews their differentiation, potentially giving rise to cancer stem cells. We're very interested to see why does the virus target stem cell and how is it able to survive in there, you know, especially with the interferon response being present in these cells, which is a, a matter of debate. Um, and how can we correct stem cell reprogramming to avoid cancer even after, after treatment? So the key is really that many of the HCV patients dis, uh, after tr successful treatment maintain a high cancer risk. And we, th we think that these stem cells play a critical role here by being irreversibly put into a state that is pro-cancerogenic, that is independently from viral replication. So my last two minutes I want to spend on sharing with you how we're using the organoid technology to also model immunity. Now, in order to see whether, um, whether these um, organoids can, can be used in a more complex system where we can also include immune cells, we needed to find out whether they can function as antigen-presenting cells, and they do. They express HLA class 1, and if we mix them with um, HLA non-matched T cells, we see that there's robust induction of T cell response here in light gray, um, similar to when we um, you know, stimulate T cells directly with PMA and inomycin. Now, this is a very crude way to test whether these organoids can be antigen presenting. We went to a more subtle way where we used a CD8 T cell clone specific for, for a hep C peptide. When we use this hep hep C peptide to pulse the organoids, we can then test whether the CD8 T cells would re recognize these pulsed organoids and, and become cytotoxic. Um, this required um, some setup because we needed to um, monitor survival of the of the um, organoids. We turned to a mini microfluidics chips that was originally described by Andreas, Andrea P. Pavesi, where the organoids are in matrigel in the central chamber. And then you can use the T cells that you can label with cytotracker green here or others. Um, you can basically flush them through the outer channels. And then depending on the pressure and the number, you have a very trackable system on how many of these cells and at what rate they would enter into the organoid space. Now, when we co-culture these cells with the organoids without the peptide, you can see that there's very little interaction. Over time, the organoids grow, they're happy, they're, um, they're not being attacked, and the, and, and, and the T cells are, are basically cohabitating. However, when we pulse these organoids with the peptide, the situation changes, the T cells immediately attack, and over time you see extensive damage and cytotoxic activity of these cells, up to 80% of the organoids are being killed. So basically, we can use these organoids um, in, in an immunity model because they can present the FC peptides and they can activate HCV-specific CD8 T cells to eliminate, um, you know, to, to, um, to eliminate the presenting um, organoids. We are now moving this into infected organoids, uh, you know, beyond the pulsing. We are also testing um, T cells from um, HCV infected patients to see whether we can really study the natural immunity in this model. And I think in general, this is a first step to a human model in a liver-like environment to test whether, um, you know, HCV specific Im uh, immunity can be efficiently induced in a vaccine response. With this, I want to stop and acknowledge, um, you know, many people. It was a great, it is a great collaboration. Nathan, Camille, and Danielle in my group were really um, instrumental here. Um, Vishali and Todd McDevitt's group, he's a bioengineer at Gladstone, is doing the co-culture with us. Mehdi was great to do the um, network propagation. Tal and Mir Yosef's group is doing the analysis by computational and uh, Anne Erickson at, uh, Stuart, in Stuart Cooper's group was uh, generating the CDA T cell clone. Grateful to the funders. Thank you for your attention. Happy to take any questions. Okay, thanks a lot for a great talk, Melanie. So we have five minutes for questions. Um, I'm not sure if I can see them. Yeah, okay. A talk, uh, excuse, excuse me, question by Felix. Do you see HCV proteins translocated to the stem cell nucleus where they could control transcription or splicing? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think we have spent a lot of time looking for core in the nucleus. Um, we cannot find it in these stem cells. It's very hard because 
um, we can really, it's a very low level of infection. Um, you might have seen on the, on, the, on the first graph that I showed, it was actually a DDPCR that we had to develop in order to detect the infection, negative strand and positive strand. We can detect also by RNA scope. Um, the viral RNA. It's very hard to really study individual proteins in these in, in these organoids because of the low in the low expression rate. But we have so far never succeeded in any in any system to see any proteins of HCV directly in the nucleus. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question from Joost. Uh, he's mentioning that organoids organoids are polarized. So, what are the differences depending on the site? Yes, very good question. I think we deal with this all the time. Um, we can flip organoids. Um, usually you have, um, you know, you have the basolateral side um, um, outside um, and the apical side inside. And in order to have some infections, you sometimes have to flip the, or the organoids. Um, we can do this by taking them out of matrigel. It's really the matrigel around them that decides the polarization. They become more fragile, but that's absolutely possible. The HCV infection with the liver organoids, we do mostly by actually breaking um, the, um, 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 the, we can also put them, you know, infect them as single cell, um, in a single cell format, and then put them together after the infection, they form organoids again. That's one of the very successful methods that we're using. Or you can just gently break the organoid structure so that you have, um, you know, a breakdown in the um, in the tight junctions, and you also see very successful infection of the organoid. So there's lots of things that you have to play with, but um, how you infect, um, short of microinjecting it into the middle, is something that is very important to consider. Okay. Um, so you briefly mentioned this CRISPR-based test. Can you elaborate a bit on, on the advantages compared to, you know, the PCR tests? Uh, yes. So I think it's the yeah. bottleneck here. I know. So the, 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 the CRISPR testing is something that is, a, I think, a great opportunity. I think we all know that, um, you know, these RNA detecting CRISPRs can very efficiently find viral RNAs and, and directly activate CRISPR, uh, the, the, the enzyme. The enzyme then becomes, um, you know, uh, um, a sort of collateral cutter. It's not only cutting the, the target, it can also uh, cut a, a reporter that we, that we provide and that basically provides the fluorescence to, to measure. The, the, the interesting part for, for the CRISPR versus um, PCR is um, that you don't have to necessarily amplify. Unfortunately, all of the CRISPR technologies that are currently on the market do still reverse transcribe, amplify, and then potentially forward transcribe and do the, the CAS-13 assay, which is a multi-step process, which takes away from the advantage of doing this rapid, cheap, and potentially at home. Um, so we have invested in the last um, years and months uh, on doing this with direct detection. We have worked initially on HIV and now on SARS-CoV-2. Um, this requires some, do you know, strong optimization because the, 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 the LOD or the limit of detection of regular CRISPR with one guide, for example, is sort of in the 100,000 copies per microliter, so not in a therapeutic or diagnostic window. Um, but if you do guide combinations, optimization of the enzymes and the reporter, and you use enhanced optics of, this, of the mobile phone, which actually functions 10 times better than a blade reader in the laboratory to pick up the fluorescence in a, in a reliable and fast way, I think you can optimize the assay to perform um, in the in the 100 to 10 copies per microliter range, which is still above, um, above the um, PCR sensitivity, but we believe is something that would, would detect spreaders in a, in a, in a frequent an, a environment. So I think that the push here is to make frequent um, testing available so that you can test when you go into a building, uh, um, you know, a doctor's office or the Gladstone Institutes or Berkeley dorms, um, so that um, that we can, um, you know, detect spreaders early and isolate them. Um, people have modeled that if we would do this every day, like when we do our toothbrushing, we would and would immediately identify people who are, um, you know, infectious. We would have a zero percent infection rate. Does it still require nasal swabs, or would that work with saliva? Or? Good, good, good question. So we're focusing on nasal swabs currently. We have a system where we have basically a nasal swab to result um, within 30-minute essay. 
Um, uh, Jennifer in Berkeley is very much focusing on saliva currently, and um, that's her specialty. So she has built up a whole lab in in uh, in Berkeley to to test saliva as a potential sample with our method or with the also advanced amplification methods. Okay, great. Thanks, Melanie. So it's time to move on to our next speaker, Javier Pizarro Cerda from the Pasteur Institute. He's heading the Yersinia research unit and is going to tell us about Yersinia species, instrumental models of bacterial pathogen evolution. Yes, so uh, we'll start. Yeah, so I would like to thank uh, very much the organizers for the opportunity to present our projects, recent projects, in the framework of this exciting symposium. So today I will not speak about uh, SARS-CoV-2, but I will speak about bacteria and also pandemics. So our unit is interested in the biology of members of the genus Yersinia which include environmental species, as well as insect and fish pathogens. But our lab is uh, mainly interested in three bacterial species that are pathogenic for humans. Yersinia testis, Yersinia pseudotuberculosis, and Yersinia enterocolitica. So Yersinia testis is the agent of plague, a disease that has marked the history of uh, humankind through three major pandemics, uh, in particular uh, pandemic in medieval times, which dramatically affected uh, Asian and European populations. Uh, today, Yersinia pestis is present in, uh, endemically in rodent populations in the Americas, in Africa, and Asia. And plague is transmitted to humans by flea bites. On the other hand, uh, Yersinia pseudotuberculosis and Yersinia enterocolitica are foodborne pathogens that uh, cause uh, intestinal infections. So these three bacterial species are very interesting models to explore pathogenicity in the bacterial world. Indeed, if we explore their phylogeny, we observe that uh, Yersinia pseudotuberculosis and Yersinia enterocolitica, which cause a very similar disease, they are really located at opposite ends of their phylogeny, while Yersinia pestis and pseudotuberculosis, which cause very different diseases, are very close uh, in genomic terms, and pestis can actually be considered as a recently emerged clone from cell tuberculosis. So we know that independent acquisition of a plasmid coding for a type three secretion system uh, plays a very important role in the silencing of uh, phagocytic and immune functions uh, in both the cell tuberculosis and the enterocolitica cluster. And we also know that Yersinia pestis also acquired uh, additional plasmid uh, which influence the adaptation to the flea and dispersion in the in mammalian body. However, this knowledge does not allow to fully explain the hypervirulence of Yersinia pestis, which can kill, for example, human beings in less than 24 hours in the absence of antibiotics, and for which the lethal dose 50 in mice is less than 10 bacteria, while pseudotuberculosis and enterocolitica they induce mild infections, and their uh, LD50 is over 100,000 bacteria. So uh, the main question that we are asking at this moment is, can we learn more on the virulence of this uh, pathogenic Yersinia by interrogating their uh, genome diversity? And for this, uh, we have the chance to have very rich historical collections in our unit, thanks to the diverse interactions that the Institute Pasteur had had with the uh, in, uh, international networks of Pasteur Institute distributed all over the world. And we hold more than 2,000 Yersinia pestis strains isolated between 1906 and uh, 2017 from all plague endemic regions in the world. We also have over 7,000 Yersinia pseudotuberculosis strains and over 44,000 enterocolitic strains isolated between the 1930s and today from all continents. So do, at this moment, we are uh, sequencing a, a significant fraction of our uh, historical collection, trying to maximize the geographical, temporal, and or, uh, origin sample diversity of these strains and with the idea of characterizing the bacterial population structure for each one of these three species. And we are also uh, correlating epidemiological data with genetic markers, with the idea to identify novel virulence factors that uh, will be explored in a cellular system or in, in animal infection models. 
So we are in the process of uh, sequencing our, our bacterial collections, but we have, we have already started to, to exploit a uh, whole genome uh, data. And in collaboration with uh, Sylvain Brice, which is the head of the biodiversity and epidemiology of bacterial pathogens here in Pasteur, we have already uh, analyzed in-house the sequence genomes together with public databases. And we have recently proposed a, a novel core genome multilocal sequence typing scheme uh, based on 500 core genes that allow, to, allow us to explore and to revisit the phylogeny of the Yersinia. Therefore, we have recently proposed uh, an updated classification of Yersinia, which allow us to uh, discover six novel Yersinia species, non-pathogenic species, and we have also revisited and uh, redefined the classification of the pseudotuberculosis and the enterocolitica clusters. So for example, in the enterocolitica cluster, we have here Yersinia pestis, which is located among the different pseudotuberculosis biotypes. And interestingly, the pseudotuberculosis strains that previously have been used to investigate the pathogenicity of pestis have been uh, strained from the biotype 15. And our uh, novel classification suggests that it is instead a uh, strain from biotype 11, which are more relevant to explore the transition between pseudotuberculosis and the hypervirulence of pestis. We have also revisited, revisited the enterocolitica cluster and also the most studied strain in, in this cluster has been previously the biotype 1B strain. However, uh, this strain is very rare. And for example, taking advantage of uh, data from our national reference laboratory here in France and in other European countries, the, there is a very similar situation. The biotypes which are more uh, commonly associated, isolated from patients are bacteria from biotypes 2 and biotype 4. And interestingly, these bacteria display different uh, infection phenotypes. Uh, biotype 2 bacteria are more uh, associated to uh, systemic infections, while biotype 4 bacteria are more associated to localized infections. We have started to explore the uh, differential pathogenicity of these bacteria by using uh, cellular infection systems. And we are already able to observe differences in the uh, infection of cells using these different biotypes. Biotype 4 strains, they form filaments in cells and they form like this uh, extended uh, tubular intracellular compartment labeled with the lysosomal associated membrane protein 1, LAMP1, while this, uh, uh, the biotype 2 strains uh, form this uh, more uh, rounded uh, vesicular compartment. But we also observe bacteria in other intracellular compartments that we have not uh, yet identified. Interestingly, these phenotypes are independent of the type 3 secretion system, and also they are independent from the function of the type 6 secretion system. Therefore, at this moment, we are generating a transposon mutant library of these different biotypes to explore chromosomal factors, which are, are necessary, certainly, for creating these different uh, uh, niches in, in whole cells. We are also uh, exploring, uh, we would like to explore this transposome mutant library, okay, red dot, uh, in animal uh, host. So we have developed tools to explore the, the infection in living animals with this bacteria. And of course, we would like to explore the interaction of the bacteria and the host performing a dual RNA sex studies to investigate how both partners respond to infection. We are also interested in investigating the interactions between uh, Yersinia, uh, the intestinal Yersinia, and the microbiota. We have previously shown that, for example, in the case of Listeria monocytogenes, the most pathogenic strains are able to modulate microbiota by secreting bacteriocins. And we have already identified uh, the molecules secreted by Yersinia, which also could affect infection in this direction. So, uh, as a conclusion perspective, our genome wide data. A uh, data set should allow us to better characterize the population structure of these pathogenic Yersinia species. Correlation of ep epidemiological data and genomic markers, together with RNA-seq and TNSEC data, should allow us to identify potential novel viral factors. 
and our cellular and animal infection models will, uh, will allow us to further explore the functionality of novel identified virulence factors. So with this, I would like to finish. I would like to thank uh, members of our unit, in particular, Cyril and Sophie and Guilhem for genomic studies and Marion, Anne and Ebert for functional studies. I would like to thank also our collaborators in the Pasteur Institute, in the Pasteur International Network, our funders, and I would like to thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Javier. Great talk. So we still have a few minutes for questions. So please type them um, either in the Q&A um, Q box or in the chat box. I don't see any questions right now. Okay, as a chairman, I'm supposed to ask one, Javier, but since we talked recently, I'm <laughs> uh, out of question. Um, okay, no question. For, ah, okay, the question from Jeff Cox. The new structures are super interesting. What is the pH? So the pH is not acidic, and uh, these structures are supposed to be uh, autophagic vacuoles. So uh, there is work from the group of uh, Frank Lafont in the Institut Pasteur of Lille, and also we have German colleagues who ha uh, have explored the, the generation of these uh, compartments, and uh, they suggest that uh, the Yersinia subvert the autophagic pathway, so these, these vacuoles are non-acidic. Okay. Another question from Melanie Amon. How different are the genomes of the more virulent strains versus the other? Uh, thank you, Melanie. So, well, I have to say that at this moment, we are still in the process or analyzing this data. So, I, uh, I am not able to provide you uh, the list of the, of, of the genes that we would like to explore in the future, but I hope to be able to come to you soon with, uh, with our further results. Okay, Carmen is asking how the new phylogeny is, uh, differs from what was published earlier by Mark Achtman. Well, uh, let's say that uh, the, the work of Mark, he has, uh, let's say, like uh, depicted the very, the very big uh, picture of the, of the phylogeny, uh, mainly for pesticides. And uh, we, we agree on this phylogeny, but uh, we have uh, more data and we, can, we, we have more precise uh, uh, more, more precise distribution of different uh, lines that have gone, for example, to Vietnam, that have gone to, to Madagascar. So we agree on the, on the big lines, but, but we have a better resolution of uh, some biotypes and also for some lineages that have not been explored previously. For example, Mark didn't have information about some uh, African strains that we have in our collections and, and that we are going to add to our uh, phylogenies. Okay, uh, another question from Melanie. She's asking, uh, is the new phylogeny expanding the controversial intravacular phenotypes? Uh, well, I will, Melanie, what do you mean by controversial intravacular phenotypes? Well, Melanie, you can perhaps switch on your mic. Can I speak? Sorry, I can't type that fast. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I thought that um, that uh, the Americans, or at least um, Matthew uh, Lawrence, had this uh, whole intravacular phenotype that uh, was not accepted by everyone in the field. And so I didn't know if it just came from different strains that people were using, kind of like with listeria, people are not using the same strains, and that could explain the phenotypes. Okay, well, actually, we've, we... We agree on, and we find results similar to the ones that Matthew have, uh, have observed. And actually, the Yersinia have been commonly considered extracellular pathogens. But now, exploring all these pathogens, we observe that they all can have uh, an intracellular niche. And very interestingly, even if we compare, for example, Yersinia rucari, which is a fish pathogen, it manipulates the, let's say like the uh, endomembrane vesicular trafficking in a very similar way as enterocolitica and pseudotuberculosis, which are very, very different bacteria. So, and, and again, this is independently of the plasmids. So there are, there are certain, and there is a lot to explore because there are, at, the, at this moment, we don't know which are the, the chromosomal factors. 
which are responsible for controlling this this uh, this uh, behavior. So we hope that with our TN Sec library, we will be able to to identify the first factor of Yersinia that are responsible for this uh, subversion. Thank you. <clears throat> there are two more questions, but in the interest of time, we're just going to take one from Judy Saka. Nari, uh, any ideas of why certain biotypes are more common than others? So thank you, Judy. Really great question. And actually, this, for example, in the case of uh, Enterocolitica, this is also something that we are exploring. Uh, there are di different reservoirs in nature. And uh, we are exploring precisely with different institutes uh, working with, uh, with farms in France which are the, the, the bacteria that are circulating between animals and human populations. So there is a, certainly a, uh, an interaction and some, some bacteria are more able to come from animals to humans, some biotypes, and we are trying to, to explore this, uh, uh, this question precisely at this moment. Okay, thank you again, Javier. <clears throat> thank you. So it's time to move on to our next speaker, Daniel Swainy, who is assistant professor at uh, UCSF and she's going to talk about uh, the global phosphorylation landscape of SARS-CoV-2 infection. Okay, um, yeah, thank you. I'm really excited to talk to you guys today. Um, let me know if for some reason you can't see my screen. Um, so I just wanna start off by saying that this was a really large collaborative effort between um, over a dozen different labs around the world. So when I say we, I mean, we as a group of you know 60 some scientists um, did things and I've tried to acknowledge people on individuals or uh, different labs on individual slides where they contributed. So we're, we're returning here back to SARS-CoV-2 and um, um, I want to talk about phosphorylation in the context of SARS-CoV-2. So I don't think anyone I need to convince anyone that we need to study SARS-CoV-2 but what I want to just emphasize is that phosphorylation plays a really important role in the process of viral replication. And this is an example case of influenza A from a recent um, review where PI3K signaling, PKC, um, MAPK, all these different phosphorylation pathways play a role in the attachment, entry, and release of a virus. And it's not a coincidence that phosphorylation signaling plays an important role in viral biology because um, unlike controlling protein abundance, which requires the process of transcription and translation to regulate protein abundance levels, phosphorylation is a really rapid mechanism to manipulate host cell biology. By the simple addition or removal of a phosphate group by kinases and phosphatase, you can very rapidly uh, activate or inactivate a substrate, change its protein interactions, change its localization, and not only can you do this for that substrate, but phosphorylation signaling is set up such that this can then propagate to many other proteins in the system. So this is a way for viruses with the limited arsenal of proteins to very quickly and broadly manipulate host cell biology. In the same way, it's also a mechanism for the host cell to rapidly combat viral um, replication. So phosphorylation plays a really important role in um, the process of um, a viral infection. And so we wanted to use um, proteomics, which is arguably the best tool uh, currently available to study globally what the phosphorylation signature is upon SARS-CoV-2 infection. And our goal with this is to really identify what kinases and phosphorylation sites and pathways are regulated so we could potentially identify drugs that could be used to target this. So here we used um, proteomics approach to map global um, phosphorylation changes upon infection. Then we use some bioinformatics approaches that can translate these phosphorylation changes into kinase activity measurements and use this to prioritize kinases, which there are many drugs against kinases, um, that we could um, then prioritize and test to see if they have an antiviral effect. So that's the overall workflow that we used here. And then a few more details about the experimental approach. So here we're using Vero E6 cells, which is an African green monkey cell. They are highly infectable by SARS-CoV-2, so that's why they were selected. And what we do is we either infect them with SARS-CoV-2 or, or we perform a mock infection. And the virus is incubated with the cells for an hour and then removed. And then over the course of 24 hours, we harvest cells in biological triplicate. And then all of those samples are analyzed in two ways, either for phosphorylation signaling, 
changes or for looking at protein abundance changes upon infection. Well, the specific mass spec approach here we use is a DIA, which is data independent acquisition, which gives us really high quantitative reproducibility of our measurements. And then the final step in the process is that because we are using this African green monkey cell, which is not well annotated, we then map all of our proteins and individual phosphorylation sites to their um, respective orthologous um, human proteins so that we can use the wealth of annotation information for human proteins to understand the changes that we observe. Um, and just to convince you that this data is, is um, worth looking at, we do observe very robust infection upon um, uh, in this experiment with, um, the, we're able to detect over half of the SARS-CoV-2 proteins from the experiment and many of them are increasing by several orders of magnitude over the course of 24 hours of infection. So um, first let's look at protein abundance measurements. Here we find that protein abundance is minimally altered upon infection. So here we're looking at significantly up or down regulated proteins. So those that are changing by twofold or more with an adjusted p-value of less than 0.05. And what you can see is that by 24 hours, we only identify about 160 proteins that are significantly altered. And if we take a volcano plot where we have the, you know, the ratio of change, on the x-axis and the p-value on the y-axis, you can see that many of those proteins that are significantly upregulated are the viral proteins themselves that we detect. And then there's uh, a collection of other proteins that are downregulated. In contrast, when we look at phosphorylation signaling, this really represents a very primary host response here. By 24 hours, we can detect uh, approximately 1,500 phosphorylation sites that are significantly altered. And you can see here, um, looking at the volcano plot, that there are uh, a wealth of different phosphorylation sites that are changing here. Um, this is both great news, we have a lot of data to interpret, but also uh, can be overwhelming to make sense of all these different phosphorylation sites. So what we did to help translate this into data that's um, more um, easy to understand is use a tool called phosphate, which is um, developed by our collaborator Pedro Beltrao. And what this is, is a database of human kinases and their respective substrates and the mapping in between those. And so what we can do is input our substrate phosphorylation sites that we detect in our proteomics experiment and how they're regulated. And this will aggregate those substrates together, map them to a kinase, and then give us predictions about how that kinase activity is changing upon infection. So here's a heat map with the results of some of the most highly um, changing kinase activities in our data set. So we have the different um, infection time course up to 24 hours. And then in red are kinases that are significantly activated or increased in activity upon infection. And in blue are those kinases that are decreasing in activity upon infection. And there's a lot of interesting data here. We have a couple of vignettes on CDKs, for example, and um, P38 signaling in the paper. But I just want to highlight um, one uh, kinase here, which are um, the casein kinase 2 or CK2, which is a multi-protein kinase and ties back into what Nevin talked about earlier. And what we observe for casein kinase 2 is it increases in infection, almost increases in activity almost immediately upon infection, and that increased activity is maintained throughout 24 hours. And so we thought this was really interesting because as Nevin mentioned, Casein kinase 2 is a direct interaction of the end protein. And then in our phosphorylation analysis, we measure many downstream substrates of casein kinase 2 that are all increasing in abundance. And many of these substrates are associated with cytoskeletal re reorganization. And so to kind of dive into this phenotype, um, we teamed up um, with some excellent microscopists who performed immunofluorescence microscopy. And what we have here is KCO2 cells that are infected with SARS-CoV-2. And we have casein kinase 2 labeled in green and protein from SARS-CoV-2 in, in red, and then the cytoskeletal protein F-actin. And what they observed if we zoom in right here is that we get a lot of these F-actin philopodia. And indeed, these philopodia are more prevalent in cells that have been infected as composed to mock um, infected cells. 
So infection seems to promoting, be promoting these philopodia. And actually, when we teamed up with the Fisher lab from NIH, they use transmission electron microscopy and can see at the end of these philopodia, there's viral budding, so intact viral particles coming out of, of these philopodia. So this is a way for the virus to be tra um, transmit from cell to cell. OK, so this is some cool biology. Does this mean anything? Oh, excuse me. So one thing we wanted to do was then look at, can we target CK2? to impact um, viral uh, infection. And so there's a phase two clinical drug. Oh, no, can you still see? Hopefully, um, that a, a somiterostid, serotip, which has um, a phase two clinical drug for pancreatic cancer. And when we do these infection assays um, from the Garcia Sastra in the Vignuzi lab, they can see that this has um, 2.4 micromolar um, efficacy in uh, vero E6 cells. So this is capable of regulating um, SARS-CoV-2 infection. Then does this have any impact for human health at all? So recently this drug was given emergency authorization use for severe COVID patients. And there was a case where a patient had been um, for two weeks on a ventilator given a host of different drugs. Nothing was working. They give them this drug, which, um, and within one day, they were off of ventilator, and five days later, they were home. So this is an example where this drug targeting CK2 was highly effective for this particular patient. Um, and then CK2 is also um, um, playing a role, potentially, in the immune response to SARS-CoV-2 infection. So there's a recent paper here where um, looking at this multi-system inflammatory syndrome that's been observed in children with COVID-19. And in this case, they looked at um, either SARS-CoV-2 infected children, healthy children, those that have Kawasaki disease that have a similar phenotype and clinical features to this um, multi-system inflammatory syndrome, or patients who have this MIS-C um, effect. And one thing they observed is that in this inflammatory syndrome, there were higher levels of um, casein kinase 2 antibodies than in just normal COVID-2 infection, healthy patients, or even in this Kawasaki disease. So it seems like um, the development of autoantibodies against CK2 is also playing a role in the response to COVID-19 for children. So just to close, um, we did this type of analysis for um, all the dysregulated pathways we could identify, mapped them to different drugs, and tested many of these drugs in different cell models. And in total, we were able to identify 38 drugs that had a therapeutic window here where their IC50 was a lower um, concentration than their cellular toxicity. So in summary, we used a phosphoproteomics approach to unbiasedly um, identify inactivated or activated kinases and identify dramatic rewiring of the host cell. And then I'd just like to finish by acknowledging that this, again, this is a large team effort, um, really spearheaded by the Krogan Lab and the QCRG efforts and collaborating with many people on this call and funded by the NIH and DARPA. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, great talk. Um, okay, I'm sure there are going to be lots of questions. All right, so first question from Sherry Mukherjee. Um, great talk, Danielle. It seems that CK2 is actively activated early and stays active over the course of infection. Is there a role for CK2 in early phases of infection other than egress? I mean, yeah, that's a good question. We see its activity increasing almost immediately upon infection, but I don't know functionally what that means. Okay, um, another question from Felix. Nice talk. Is it the virus that buds at the tip of the philopodia or is it the vesicle transporting the virus that fuses there? Oh, I mean, we think it's the virus. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I, I was wondering. So so you showed this this nice um, data on on the actin philopodia. Did you um, follow up on on other cell biological aspect here, or was this just um, the focus on 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 actin? Um, yeah. I mean, in the paper, we also have um, some experiments looking at cell cycle regulation. We see down regulation of several. Um, 
or CDKs, and we show that this causes a, um, a higher level of cells to be in the M phase of the cell cycle, and you can target CDKs to limit viral um, infection. And then we also have a, a vignette on P38 and MAPK signaling, which is activated upon infection. Okay. Uh, not, uh, thanks. Another question from you, <clears throat> Enninga. In relation to Nevan's talk on multiplexing data, did you do phosphoproteomics in different cell types and subtract the data? You know, for, so for that paper, we only had it in the Vero E6 cells. But for um, um, since then, we have done it in three other cell types, I think, uh, Kalu3, Keiko2, and uh, the A549 ACE2. And um, so now we're trying to compare those. We see casein kinase 2, for example, activated in a couple of them, but not uniformly. We see um, CDKs downregulated in several of them, but not uniformly. Um, I'm particularly interested in maybe doing this in some cardiomyocytes. It's been shown that these can be really readily infected by our colleagues at the Gladstone. So I think that would be an interesting way to go in the future. The, the Philopodia phenotype that was in Vero says? Uh, Keiko 2, actually. Keiko 2, okay. Mm -hmm. And Vero. The microscopy, like the immunofluorescence microscopy was Keiko 2, and then the uh, SEM and TEM was done in Vero. Okay, thanks a lot. So um, if there is no further question, I think this will conclude this session, and we are going to reconvene in about 10 minutes. So at um, 9.30 uh, West Coast time and at 6.30 in Paris um, for a session chaired by Joost Enninger. This is the first talk by Sylvie van der Weer. Okay, thank you all for this nice session. I think uh, we can start and reconvene to have the last uh, session of the symposium. Sylvie, are you around? Yes, absolutely. Hi, Jost. Oh, hi, Sylvie. Um, so I think we just get the session started. We will have uh, two talks uh, from the Pasteur side and two talks from our friends uh, at the Bay Area. Uh, the first talk will be given by uh, Sylvie van der Werf, who is a professor at the Université de Paris and also head of a research unit at the Institute Pasteur entitled uh, Molecular Genetics of RNA Viruses. Uh, she will talk about the SARS-CoV-2 protein proximal intactome. So Sylvie, I would like you to share your screen and uh, yeah. I think you can start the talk. You will get a red dot, I think, uh, when you're short in time. And uh, to everybody, uh, please ask questions in the Q&A box, and the panelists can ask questions uh, in the chat box. So, CV? Yeah, right. Uh, can you see my screen? I'm trying to yeah. put it in full screen now. Oh. This is wrong. So this looks uh, very good. Yeah, perfect. OK, so thank you very much for the introduction. And many thanks to the organizers for inviting me to this uh, extremely interesting uh, symposium. I wish I could have uh, uh, been with you for the first, uh, um, <clears throat> the first edition of, of this um, joint um, symposium. So at the uh, molecular genetics of RNA viruses, uh, we are uh, mostly focusing on, um, on respiratory viruses and uh, among the respiratory viruses, um, mainly on influenza viruses and, and actually mainly on influenza A viruses in terms of uh, research. Uh, although uh, as a national reference center, uh, we're also interested in, in the other uh, influenza viruses and the other respiratory viruses. And uh, one of uh, our main uh, focus uh, in the lab uh, has been for many years to understand uh, the determinants of uh, uh, transmission and replication 
of um, the avian uh, influenza A viruses um, in uh, mammals and more specifically in humans and also uh, in terms of determinants of um, uh, adaptation upon circulation uh, in uh, humans. And uh, <clears throat> for some of the approaches we've been using, uh, we have been uh, leveraging on um, the implementation of um, interactomic uh, approaches, uh, uh, largely uh, carried out uh, in close collaboration with the um, laboratory of, uh, of Marc Pidal at uh, CCSB, um, and uh, also for, for the, this recent work um, with uh, Jean-Claude uh, Twizer uh, from uh, the University of uh, uh, Leuven. Uh, and so the type of um, um, essays uh, we have been widely using uh, are um, complement protein complementation uh, essays, and the latest version of that is uh, a split nanoluciferase uh, complementation assay, uh, which uh, allows to uh, reconstitute uh, actually uh, a functional uh, luciferase uh, when uh, two um, proteins uh, interact. And uh, this essay actually has been um, adapted uh, to be functional uh, in uh, yeast, in mammalian cells, but also in vitro and allowing, in that case, for some quantification. And uh, <clears throat> the, the work that has been uh, carried out and, and um, published last year uh, in collaboration with uh, Mark Vidal's lab uh, has shown that uh, by combining uh, 12 essays uh, using uh, as um, phrase uh, the proteins that, uh, and baits, uh, the different combinations of proteins that uh, of, of um, open reading frames that, that are um, fused with um, uh, either at, at the N terminus of the, or at the uh, C terminus and the various the 12 different combinations that, uh, thereof, that this is uh, actually able to retrieve protein-protein interactions uh, covering um, the type of protein-protein interactions that uh, can be retrieved by 10 different um, assays with different uh, uh, properties. Now, one application that we have been um, using of uh, those uh, so-called uh, N2H or uh, split luciferase uh, complementation assay uh, has been focusing on PB2, which is known to be a, a protein of influenza A viruses that plays a main role uh, in terms of uh, uh, determining a host range and focusing actually on the uh, ubiquitin proteasome system uh, and uh, comparing um, PB2 from uh, different uh, viruses, purely avian viruses, or from different uh, uh, human viruses that have been circulating over time um, in, 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 in humans. And interestingly, actually, we observed a correlation with the origin and duration of the circulation of the PB2 segment uh, in humans. And uh, these type of studies will also couple with uh, some functional assays and in this particular case of the ubiquitin proteasome system, this led us to identify uh, a peculiar uh, non-proteolytic cane 29 linked ubiquitination uh, by um, um, a serial 4 E3 ligase of PB2 and its role in IV replication. Now, as a reference lab, obviously we've been uh, involved in, in the SARS-CoV-2 uh, pandemic from the very first day on. And uh, so um, we uh, uh, immediately actually um, set out uh, to generate a, a collection of, um, of, um, um, of clones uh, that are gateway compatible, covering uh, the different, um, the different uh, open uh, reading frames. Now, this was not done only by us. As you can see here, it uh, really involved a large consortium uh, of uh, different groups um, from, from different uh, institutions. And so uh, currently uh, this uh, genomic uh, resource uh, includes uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, proteins, um, but also um, uh, and in different formats with different uh, type of, of tags, uh, and uh, also um, similar clones for uh, the four uh, seasonal uh, coronaviruses. 
and uh, this uh, genomic resource uh, is freely available uh, through uh, EdGene, uh, and uh, you can be uh, consulting this. Uh, <clears throat> we further uh, set out, actually, um, um, based on the previous interactomics maps um, that, uh, well, Brogan very, very, um, uh, very elegantly uh, presented, actually, the huge uh, and very impressive work that has been done to uh, um, uh, unravel actually the, uh, the the interactomic map of uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, and uh, other uh, publications have described uh, those type of maps. And when comparing uh, actually uh, the uh, overlap uh, between uh, the um, um, interacting proteins that uh, have been identified. Uh, one can see that there is overlap, but there is also there are also main differences which can be related to uh, the fact that different cells have been used, um, HEC 293 T cells, peripheral blood mononuclear cells, or lung adenocarcinoma cells. Uh, although uh, in all these uh, studies, um, rather classical uh, IPMS uh, has been used. Uh, so uh, with um, uh, a strong collaboration with uh, Etienne de Coyot uh, from the University uh, of Lille uh, and uh, others also, uh, uh, we um, implemented uh, approximately dependent biotinination labeling, so called bio ID um, uh, interactomic um, approach. Uh, so, for uh, those of you uh, who are not uh, too familiar with this, so this uh, proximity approach uh, uses uh, the, um, the baits that are uh, so the viral proteins that will be fused uh, to uh, an um, um, abortive uh, uh, mutant of uh, the E. coli biotin uh, ligase, bare A. Uh, which will be uh, in the presence of ATP, so typically in um, live cells, uh, to transform that into biotinoyl AMP, which can then diffuse approximately away uh, up to 10 nanometers uh, and, um, um, and to be uh, conveniently linked uh, to uh, the proximal um, uh, host uh, or interacting or directly or indirectly interacting uh, proteins. Um, this uh, also allows, because there is a covalent link of the biotin with the, with the proteins, uh, to um, carry out um, uh, a rather uh, stringent uh, solubilization, uh, including uh, the use of SDS, and uh, making this amenable to uh, studying uh, proteins that are uh, membrane proteins or, or in the vicinity of, of membranes. Then a streptavidin capture uh, and uh, um, digestion um, by uh, trypsin, proteolytic digestion um, on, on the beads, uh, and, and uh, will be followed by uh, the classical uh, mass spectroscopy. So, really, the advantage of this type of approach, and, and there are other uh, similar um, other versions of that, is that uh, one can detect protein protein interactions in poorly soluble fractions. Uh, as well as weak and transient interactions uh, that uh, could be uh, really biologically uh, crucial. So, what was this was carried out actually for 28 of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, viral proteins with tags either at the N-terminus or C-terminus, um, for which 56 stable and tetracycline-inducible uh, HAC293 cell lines were uh, generated. Uh, and uh, interactomes um, um, and mass spectroscopy was, was performed uh, both in basal conditions and also in conditions uh, uh, upon transfection of coli IC uh, to try actually to uh, recapitulate uh, the induction uh, of uh, the antiviral uh, response uh, in line with the fact that uh, we know that in the uh, COVID um, in COVID-19, there is a defect in, in, in uh, the interferon type 1 and 3 responses uh, and, and also exacerbated uh, inflammation. 
So altogether, taking into account the, the um, triplicates, the biological triplicates, uh, 30 control samples, um, this whole work actually uh, resulted in the analysis of uh, over 280 samples of uh, more than 100 million cells. And it led to the identification in total of uh, uh, over 2,500 host proteins uh, linked to the 28 viral proteins uh, by um, uh, some uh, 10,000 uh, high confidence uh, proximity interactions. I should point out that actually uh, interactions um, or, or host proteins uh, that interacted with um, um, eight or more baits uh, were excluded uh, from uh, the high confidence uh, interactions that were uh, defined. Uh, <clears throat> In parallel and, and in close uh, actual uh, interaction, um, um, a, a similar study uh, has been uh, carried out uh, in Toronto uh, by uh, Anne-Claude um, uh, using a, a very related approach, uh, so-called the mini triple uh, ID in a different uh, cell line, in A549 uh, cell lines. And actually, there was uh, about uh, 30 to 40 percent uh, overlap, uh, depending on uh, different uh, bits. And also, in collaboration uh, with uh, the lab in Toronto, but uh, uh, in addition uh, with um, the um, um, with other um, um, collaborators, uh, this uh, has been uh, also uh, been. Um, 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 this has also led actually to the development of a website and uh, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself and so I will get back to that uh, in a second. Okay, so, uh, this well, is, uh, there is a problem with the uh, warning signal that you are running late. Uh, we okay. are really late. Uh, it would be great if you could wrap up within uh, the next minute, please. Okay. Uh, so, uh, what is interesting is that more than 90% of new interactions were uh, identified uh, and uh, um, so very similarly to, to, to this, the, the uh, analysis that uh, um, um, and even uh, presented uh, based on data integration, uh, the localization of the different uh, um, interactors uh, were uh, defined uh, relating uh, to uh, different uh, compartments. Uh, and as, as I mentioned uh, previously, uh, this uh, led to the uh, development of an interactive uh, website uh, allowing to, to visualize uh, the interactions themselves, those that were specifically uh, gained uh, um, upon a poly IC transfection and uh, also uh, those uh, actually uh, that were uh, increased. Uh, so I will not uh, dwell in the interest of time on uh, the, uh, the, the actual results, but uh, um, for NSP2, uh, this uh, really um, um, increases the importance of uh, the crucial role of NSP2 in innate uh, immunity uh, evasion. Uh, with new interactors, uh, and interestingly, uh, of uh, uh, Regai and, and other sensors, uh, uh, and uh, really uh, providing new data uh, and new links with the innate immunity uh, pathway uh, for uh, different uh, uh, viral proteins, and um, providing actual insights into how SARS-CoV-2 proteins orchestrate host cell regulation uh, pathway and control uh, cell defense. Uh, I will go very quickly here, uh, just um, when um, I'm really integrating sorry, I'm that to either the rig eye pathway or in the uh, vesicular transport uh, membrane fusion pathway, we can see redundancy and uh, actions and interactions, um, multiple act interactions at different uh, steps. And uh, just um, uh, this uh, really uh, provides uh, a wealth of uh, new uh, interactions uh, that uh, may be implicated in major mechanisms 
and uh, new avenues to explain uh, the different uh, symptoms of uh, COVID-19 uh, by integrating that uh, with both uh, the um, variations of the virus itself and uh, with uh, the clinical data to better understand the SARS-CoV-2 pathogenesis. And so um, just to acknowledge uh, the different uh, collaborators uh, and uh, um, so Etienne Poyo was instrumental, Yogo Sofianatos, uh, and Fritz Roth and Anko Gangas, uh, our collaborators from CCSB and from my lab, uh, Yves Jacob, who has been very instrumental, Patricia Cassoni, Caroline Dembré, and Anastasia Komarova, and uh, the various funding sources. Thank you, and sorry for getting over time. Yeah, thank you, Sylvie, and uh, sorry about the technical issue that you didn't get the red warning. Uh, just uh, rapidly, a question from uh, Nevan. Uh, he says, great talk, Sylvie. Uh, do you have any comparisons to the genome-wide CRISPR screens uh, that have been coming out? To the what? I'm sorry, I didn't get your question. There are now uh, genome-wide CRISPR screens uh, that have been done. And uh, the question is if you have done comparisons between your data set, uh, data sets and uh, those screens. Uh, I'm afraid I cannot answer that question. Uh, I don't know whether this has been done. But I don't have that comparison at hand right now. Um, but this would be definitely extremely interesting to look at. Okay. So as we are running late, uh, there's no more questions. I think we continue with the uh, next talk uh, that will be given by our friends uh, in San Francisco, uh, Oren Rosenberg, uh, who's associate professor at uh, QBI, uh, UCSF uh, Department of Medicine. And he will talk about structural studies of uh, endogenous proteins, I guess uh, probably a bit on TB. So uh, Oren, please uh, share your screen and we go. Uh, it says that I'm failing to share my screen. Um, I think somebody has to stop sharing for me to... Sylvie, do you mind uh, to stop sharing your screen? Sylvie, can you hear me? think she's not uh, at her desk. Oh, okay. It worked now. Okay, so, great. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. It's a real honor to be here. Um, very excited to be joining this group and, and discussing our work. Uh, now then, had a chance to talk about our last uh, six months worth of work on SARS-CoV-2, but I want to talk also today about our work on another very important airborne disease, tuberculosis. And we shouldn't forget that tuberculosis is still the number one killer, uh, infectious disease killer in the world. Three people die from tuberculosis every minute. And like SARS, it's also airborne and uh, it poses a huge risk to people's health and in the public. Um, tuberculosis is extremely difficult to treat. And here you see a typical treatment regimen for uh, multidrug resistant tuberculosis. So the normal course of treatment for tuberculosis is six months of uh, multidrug therapy. If you have multidrug resistant TB, it could be a couple of years of multiple drugs with many uh, side effects and, um, and even injections that can cause lots of complications. Uh, and the reason that mycobacteria are so difficult to treat is because they have this very complex cell wall. So, you know, like other organisms, they have an inner membrane that is made of mostly phospholipids, some other interesting um, mycobacterial specific lipids. Um, but then they also have a peptidoglycan, uh, which is covalently attached to an arabinogalactan layer, um, which is then covalently attached to the mycomembrane. And this mycomembrane is a waxy outer coat that's highly resistant to environmental stresses, um, where, which the mycobacteria will encounter in, inside of um, the immune cells where they reside in, during tuber tuberculosis infection or in the environment uh, where, they, where 
uh, most mycobacteria live. And this waxy outer coat is also um, very resistant to, um, uh, to penetration by drugs. Um, but it is, it is the, one of the main targets of uh, anti-mycobacterial -myco therapy. So for example, isoniazid, which is one of the frontline treatments for tuberculosis, targets the uh, production of mycolic acids in the mycomembrane. So if we look more closely at what composes this uh, unique mycomembrane, what we see is that um, it's composed of these very unusual long mycolic acids. So I put here for comparison a phospholipid that you might find in the inner membrane, and here you have a, a molecule that has maybe 28 to 48 carbons, depending on what the fatty acid tails um, on the phospholipid uh, are, might be. But the uh, mycolic acid is almost twice as big, um, and through these special cyclopropane uh, linkages, it's able to fold up into a very unique structure, um, but still it's a, it's a complex molecule and it's very challenging for the bacteria to manufacture and a lot of its genome is dedicated to making uh, these complex lipids that are required for uh, resisting environmental stress and antibiotics. So if we look more closely at, at a typical mycolic acid, now there's many different flavors of these. They can be um, substituted in different ways with different complex names, alpha, methoxy, and keto substitutions. But basically they have the same uh, overall uh, body plan with on one side a, um, uh, an alpha branch, which is a shorter um, mycolic acid uh, sub substructure that's uh, manufactured by the fatty acid synthase one. And then the more complex meromycolate branch, which is manufactured by fatty acid synthase two and amylated by fad D32, um, which uh, makes it prepared for its further synthesis. And the key enzyme that regulates the, um, the final assembly of mycolic acids is PKS13. And PKS13 is one of the leading um, developmental drug targets. And I think you'll, you'll see why, because it has many activities that can be targeted by drugs. And there have been uh, a number of reports in the literature of different inhibitors that are uh, um, strongly in, um, bactericidal um, that, that target PKS13. And this um, enzyme takes the alpha branch and the meromycolate branch and joins them together in a clason-like condensation into the mycolic acid. Um, and so we got excited about figuring out um, how this enzyme PKS13 works so that we could develop new um, inhibitors that would eventually target PKS13. And we, um, uh, although uh, people had tried in the past to overexpress these proteins um, and purify them for structural studies, they were never successful because, first of all, it's a very large protein with over 1,800 amino acids, but also because um, it's, it, it's so intimately uh, involved with these big hydrophobic substrates that it was a challenge to get a stable complex um, uh, that was uh, purifiable. And so we took a different approach, which was to go into the genome of mycobacteria. In this case, we're using Mycobacterium smegmatis, a close relative of tuberculosis that doesn't need BSL-3 um, handling. And we modified the genome to put a uh, proteolysis site and a GFP um, onto the C-terminus of this protein. And um, with that, we were able to purify it directly from the organism, so no overexpression. Um, and what I think I'll be able to show you is that by taking this approach, we were able to purify this enzyme directly with all of its, or many of its substrates attached, uh, which gave us very unique insights into how it was working. So just kind of to look at the overall body plan of PKS is you have uh, this ketosynthase domain that does the actual joining of the meromycolate and the alpha chain. You have an uh, acetyl acyl transferase domain that brings in the alpha chain. And then these N and C terminal ACPs, which carry around the hydrophobic 
substrates from one domain to the other uh, throughout the cycle. And this work has been a great collaboration with my wonderful colleague Bob Stroud uh, and his lab. And uh, most of the work here was done by these, uh, this trio of fabulous people, Kate, Jen, and, and Sasha. Um, so, <coughs> and uh, uh, Sasha just left UCSF to run the microscopy facility at uh, UT Austin, uh, which is a great loss for us. So um, we were able to obtain a structure of this, uh, of this, someone just, uh, uh, we were able to obtain a structure um, at uh, 1.8 angstrom resolution, one of the, probably one of the highest resolution cryo-EM structures uh, to date. And I just, for the aficionados, show a little bit of the density over here in the corner. Um, and what we see is that there's a dimer of the KS and the AT domain. Um, but what was really satisfying is that because of our native purification strategy, we were able to um, purify a whole range of different states of the machine. So we had the highest resolution structure did not show an interaction with the ACP, um, but in our uh, in two structures that were at around two and a half angstrom resolution, or a little better, uh, we were able to see two unique positions of the ACP. And um, I, I won't have time to go into all of the details, but I'll just point out that in uh, the first position of the N-terminal ACP, what we see is that um, the ACP is poised to grab the meromycolate from a tunnel that brings the meromycolate, this very large hydrophobic substrate, um, into this in initiating tunnel. And, and um, the, uh, the N-terminal ACP grabs it from there by the uh, P-pant arm that's joined to the, the NACP. And then through a process that we're not totally clear of, it shifts over to the other side uh, of the KS and deposits that molecule, um, that meromycolate chain into a second tunnel uh, that contains the active site of the enzyme, poising this um, hydrophobic substrate, meromycolate, for the reaction. Um, and if we look at the, um, uh, the other domain, major domain in the, um, uh, in the structure, we see in the uh, acyl transferase domain, the AT domain, we see another tunnel that contains the alpha branch. Now we can't see the entirety of these substrates because they're disordered once they leave the um, cradle of the enzyme. Uh, but what we can see is that it's linked to the um, to the active site of the uh, AT domain, allowing us to see exactly how that substrate uh, is bound to the AT domain, awaiting transfer to the KS domain. Um, and so in the interest of time, because I'm running out of time, I'll just um, summarize quickly. Um, what we found is that, that this movement, which we captured in our, endo in, in our endogenous structure, takes the um, activated meromycolate and moves it into the active site. And then um, a second substrate, the acyl chain comes in and is uh, taken into the active site subsequently by uh, the other ACP. Um, I just wanna finish with a little summary. Uh, you know, I think we all think of uh, uh, what I call structural biology 1.0. This is where I started my career, where we would uh, overexpress fragments in E. coli or other uh, other cells, um, mammalian cells, and then purify pieces of of complex machinery. And this is a very you know wonderful strategy that we still employ in the lab. Um, but I think you know what it misses is the ability to see how whole systems come together. And so this endogenous purification strategy that we took with, with this um, uh, project and with other projects that we've done in the lab allow us to see both. Um, so here, here in another example uh, where we looked at the ESX secretion machinery, uh, another important virulence determinant in TD, we were able to purify all of the components of um, the, the whole operon together by, by this endogenous uh, sort of strategy. And, you know, and, and in the case that I talked about today with PKS, we were able to purify all of the endogenous substrates. So I think this is quickly becoming, at least in my mind, the standard um, that we should be 
approaching with structural studies is, is to get the endogenous structures as something powered by the new capabilities of cryo-EM that was not possible, possible uh, previously. And, uh, you know, uh, cryo-ET and um, uh, subtomogram averaging, which uh, was discussed earlier in the, in the session, um, is, is maybe structural biology 3.0, where you actually can see something in situ. Uh, so with that, I just want to thank the people in my lab. I already thanked Bob and Kate and, and Jenny and uh, thank the funders and I thank all of you for your attention. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Aurin, for this uh, great talk uh, about the structure of biology 2.0. Is there already a question here from uh, Jeff? He asked, uh, is the position of ACP dependent on the presence of the acyl, acyl chain? Uh, do you have uh, tried mutants that are deficient for discrete enzymatic steps? Uh, well, so part of the complication, and maybe you can help us with this, Jeff, is that it's very challenging if you use native enzymes to make point mutants <laughs> because you have to select for them. Uh, and this is a, you know, it's a drug target. It's an essential gene. So making mutants that, uh, that knock out function is, is a challenge. Um, so, you know, we're, we're working on that. Uh, but I, I would love to talk to you about it. I, I think that, you know, to answer your question more directly, um, mm -hmm. The, uh, the ACP is definitely dependent, the position of the ACP is definitely dependent on the presence of the acyl chain. Um, but because of the, the, you know, what I just spoke about, I don't think we can prove that def definitively other than to just say that we see different um, associations between the acyl chain and the ACP in different positions. I have a question. Uh, the resolution, I mean, it's really impressive. I mean, you can even like look through some of the rings. Uh, so it's awesome. That's, that's uh, thanks, with, to, that's thanks with, to Sasha and Kate and their amazing work. So, yeah. With, with this uh, uh, resolution, I think it should be uh, uh, actually uh, possible to design, like to really identify like the kind of the areas that you can uh, use uh, to make some rational inhibitors. Uh, have you moved forward uh, with that? Or yeah, I think that's that's where we're going with this. And I think what what's so amazing here is because we have the native substrates, we have whole regions that we can target rather than just the active site, but tunnels, multiple tunnels showing different uh, orientations of the meromycolate as it moves through, you know, from tunnel one to tunnel two and the AT domain with its with the tunnels for the, the alpha chain. So absolutely, that's that's why we did the that's why we did it this way. So we haven't done it yet, but we're working on it. Okay, so yeah, it was okay. So I don't see any more questions right now. I think we are just right in time. Uh, so I would like uh, Oren to stop sharing the screen and we go to uh, Gerald Spett uh, from Institute Pasteur, uh, who heads a research unit here in the Department of Parasitology. And he will talk about uh, what you can read on his slide. So, yeah, it's up so to you. I, I, I assume you can see it. This is fantastic. Um, okay, so as uh, one of the organizers uh, of this meeting, of course, I would like to thank the rest of the organizers, but I also would like to thank Christophe Donfer and uh, uh, Nevin uh, Krogan to actually have established this really very exciting interaction between uh, both institutes and to be motivated to. Uh, you know, allow us to work together and develop programs together. Oops, uh, I have uh, a problem uh, to advance my slide. Uh, ah, no, okay, just click. So we're working on uh, uh, this uh, disease called Leishmaniasis that plagued mankind since uh, a long, long time and still plagues mankind, as you can see here by this map. But it's uh, a disease that is even emerging in South America, Europe, and in Southeast Asia. Now, Leishmaniasis is characterized uh, by devastating immunopathologies, uh, cutaneous and visceral involvement, which are uh, caused by uh, the protozoan parasite Leishmania that has the capacity to survive and proliferate inside macrophages and to subvert the macrophage uh, immune functions and metabolic functions. So one of the key questions that we in the field uh, of Leishmaniasis asked since many, many years, and we recently joined as well, is the question, how does Leishmania survive 
in the macrophages despite the highly inflammatory environment that is indicated here by uh, this uh, immunohistochemistry of an infected dog. Now we address this question by investigating Leishmania inflammasome interactions. Now you may know that there are different forms of inflammasomes which are characterized by uh, the extracellular uh, ligands that uh, can activate these uh, inflammatory complexes. And of course, uh, the inflammasomes are characterized by different intracellular receptor molecules. We are uh, working with the NLRP3 receptor and the inflammasome that is built by this uh, receptor. This inflammasome can be activated by LPS and ADP in culture. It's like a model system. Uh, activation leads to or induces caspase activity, which in turn cleaves pro-IL-1 beta to produce bioactive IL-1 beta that is secreted and can stimulate the inflammatory response. Now we investigate this interaction between Leishmania and the macrophage inflammasome in a, a physiologically highly relevant system where we have primary bone marrow derived macrophages uh, that we establish in culture, which then we infect with uh, lesion derived uh, amastigotes of this Leishmania species called Leishmania amazonensis that forms this gigantic vacuoles. And you can see here the individual parasites inside the vacuole. This system allows us to monitor the parasite shown here in, in red, uh, the, uh, its home, uh, which is the phagolysosome shown here in green. And of course, we also can monitor the host cell survival uh, by a simple nuclear staining. This system also allows us to have access to macrophages from the tissue, from the infected tissue, which is shown here, massively infected and red is the parasite. So we can uh, isolate the macrophages from a food pad lesion and then just assess the biology of these macrophages. Now to uh, cut a, a long story short and in it for the sake of time, uh, so Leishmania infection does not activate the inflammasome, but on the contrary, it dampens uh, the inflammasome as uh, judged first of all here uh, by this Western blot. We have a uh, small but significant uh, downregulation of caspase one activity. We also have a small but significant uh, reduction of uh, the uh, uh, abundance of uh, the receptor, intracellular receptor. This is matched with a quite dramatic downregulation uh, on transcript level uh, of uh, the two pro-inflammatory cytokines, IL-1B and IL-18, that are produced normally in response to uh, LPS ADP stimulation. And finally, uh, uh, pushing it really uh, to the extreme, we kept these bone marrow derived macrophages in culture for over 30 days and monitored what happens with the different inflammasome receptor molecules. And as you can see here, of course, they're all down regulated on transcript level as well, providing evidence that Leishmania infection causes transcriptional inhibition of uh, the pro inflammatory uh, pathways, notably the inflammasome. Of course, one of the key uh, transcription factors that regulate uh, inflammation is nf cover b So the next question we addressed was, does Leishmania affect nf cover b pathway? Again, I don't want to go into details, but I can tell you that Leishmania blocks nf cover b activation at all the different levels of uh, the nf cover b pathway. We have seen that uh, in the presence of Leishmania, um, IKK beta protein kinase is downregulated at protein levels. This causes a lack of phosphorylation of I kappa B, which uh, finally um, retains NF kappa B in the cytoplasm. We, as a matter of fact, we see during infection that we have uh, no nuclear translocation of NF kappa B, and NF kappa B itself is downregulated as well. The P65 is shown here. This uh, differences on protein level, we of course matched uh, on transcript level as well. So you can see that um, many, many members of the nf b family and of the pathway are transcriptionally downregulated. We extended this analysis by do doing a quite substantial RTQPCR uh, experiment on about 80 members of the nf b pathway. And I would like to show you this in a little bit more organized way, uh, where we separated uh, pro-inflammatory from anti-inflammatory actors that are all in this pathway. And as you can see here is Leishmania infection actually causes a downregulation of the uh, parts of the pathway that induce inflammation. But in contrast, it actually can increase the expression of the anti-inflammatory actors. So uh, Leishmania is capable of blocking the inflammatory response in a dual way acting uh, in a dichotomic fashion on these two axes of the nf pathway. We further extended this analysis more recently 
by doing a genome-wide transcript profiling by RNA-seq analysis. Uh, um, and so uh, we see just here uh, it's four biological replicates of macrophages that were either untreated or treated with LPS ADP, uninfected or infected with leishmania. I just would like to draw your attention on this part where we compare untreated, uninfected, and untreated infected. This is the volcano plot. We have about 9,000 transcripts that are modulated in response to Leishmania infection. Now, we did, of course, pathway mapping. We found many pathways that's, uh, that are enriched in our data set. Again, in green and red are uh, parts of this pathway, uh, members of this pathway, which are downregulated or upregulated. So there's again this kind of dichotomic regulation of the different pathways. And if you look more carefully on these pathways, you will realize why Leishmania is such a successful pathogen. Because, first of all, Leishmania is able to cause uh, macrophage immune suppression, as indicated by this uh, black arrow heads. It causes immortalization because it affects many pathways linked to cancer. And it also causes a metabolic shift in these macrophages, notably of the cholesterol biosynthesis. There was a massive upregulation of enzymes in this uh, pathway. And please remember this because this becomes relevant in one of the next slides. So, of course, uh, having such a massive uh, transcriptomic change, we asked the question whether Leishmina subverts the macrophage epigenic uh, regulation. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, we uh, did a chip qPCR analysis uh, investigating for uh, activation marks of histone H3, which is acetylation or K4 methylation, and inhibition mark, uh, which is uh, lysine 9 methylation. So we didn't find really an effect, a global effect of Leishmania on uh, this inhibitor remark. However, the activation mark of expression is uh, downmodulated by Leishmania expression, as uh, is uh, the acetylation mark, which also is known to induce uh, a gene expression. So we have, as a matter of fact, uh, an epigenetic uh, downmodulation uh, of the pro-inflammatory response, uh, which allows Leishmania most likely to establish successful infection. We recently published this. Uh, in cell reports. Now, this opens exciting opportunities uh, for drug discovery against the parasite, new opportunities, uh, notably to target the host, the macrophage epigenome, in order to cure these macrophages from this aberrant or sick phenotype and hopefully also to destroy Leishmania uh, in the way. Uh, we uh, investigated whether this is possible as part of a, a European project called A Paradise. We had access to an epigenetic inhibitor library that was developed uh, for anti-cancer treatment. So it was developed for mammalian histone-modifying enzymes. We applied our high-content phenotypic screening assays so where we monitor parasite survival inside the macrophage, so intracellular parasites and also extracellular parasites. Here's the screening results. Uh, and we found a class uh, of uh, quite interesting compounds which did not affect the parasite viability uh, in culture. However, uh, they only affected the survival of the parasites inside the macrophage, suggesting a host-directed uh, mechanism of action. Here are three of our hits. Uh, all three are extremely well-characterized chemical probes uh, to study epigenetics, uh, uh, and they were characterized as part of uh, the um, Structural Genomics Consortium. Uh, we followed up on one of these inhibitors, the LSD1 inhibitor. Uh, we did a, a RNA-seq analysis, uh, of the LSD1 inhibitor, we could show that the inhibitor reverts part of the parasite with this transcript profile and the killing may be mediated by lipid uh, depletion and oxidative stress. So I wanna jump this. So just to come to the outlook, what we're doing right now is of course to further investigate uh, the mechanism of Leishmania macrophage immune subversion, whether it's a passive metabolic process or an active more regulatory process. Uh, we want to study the mechanism of LSD1 uh, inhibition, uh, or, uh, the anti leishmanian effect of this inhibitor. Uh, again, uh, trying to understand why uh, K4 is uh, hypomethylated and why LSD1 counteracts this hypomethylation. And finally, uh, we're going to continue, uh, of course, on our host-directed therapy strategy. We have different hits. We also have established a preclinical model in hamsters, uh, which we, of course, would like to uh, use in order to, uh, for lead discovery. So I would like to thank my team, uh, the different projects where I've been partners or coordinators, uh, the funding agencies, uh, my uh, partner, uh, Guan Zhong Meng of the Pasteur Institute in Shanghai. Uh, we have a mixed international unit. And because it's Paris, I would like to leave you with a somewhat romantic note. 
Uh, I really hope that we find collaborative opportunities between our institutes in, in my lab, uh, of course, it's host pathogen interaction, epigenetic immune subversion, and host directed antimicrobial therapy. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Gérard. Um, so please uh, put your questions in the question answer box or for the panelists uh, in the chat box. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I asked already a question. Um, this histone modification, uh, is, it a, is it a temporary event? You, like you, you get these histone marks for how long? Uh, for example, you may get a clearance of an infection and then uh, how will this affect, uh, like if you get a reinfection? Yes, so uh, of course this goes towards trained immunity, I guess, because this is one of the key words that uh, an infection that affects the epigenetic profile of a macrophage, once the infection is cleared, maybe these macrophages remember that they were infected and are already primed uh, uh, to be stronger against the pathogen. Uh, now we will. We didn't do a longitudinal experiment. We know that uh, what we what I showed you today is after three days of infection, uh, the epigenetic marks. So of course, we're going to do now some more longitudinal studies. We also would like to address directly your question by using an antileishmanial generic uh, antileishmanial uh, drug to cure the macrophage from the infection, and then follow, of course, the epigenetic profile if it's restored to normal, or if a Transient Leishmania infection could really fix the macrophage in a, in a different phenotype. Another question I had uh, was uh, the data that you just published in Cell Reports. I mean, uh, there's uh, different pathways. You have the um, blocking of the inflammasome, the NLRP3 uh, inflammasome, and then you have the NF kappa B pathway. Uh, so what I didn't understand is uh, like uh, is there any hierarchy there or like is uh, like in, in your data? Uh, or are yes, these, uh, I think we, we went top down, uh, which means of course the inflammasome components themselves are uh, regulated by NF kappa B, um, and so this is why we first studied uh, would say the phenotypic uh, you know outcome of the infection, and once we realized that, that the inflammasome is inhibited and some components are downregulated. Of course, we went to look for the transcription regulation, and one of the regulators is, of course, NF kappa mm. So we have a question from uh, Melanie Hamon, uh, who asked uh, whether the epigenetic modification is necessary for a productive infection, or is it a correlation with the infection? And she said, because you talked very fast, uh, Gerard, she may have missed it if you said it. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was just very little time. Uh, no, for right now, uh, I fully agree it is a correlation. Uh, but of course, we would like to establish a, a more uh, a direct relationship. And I think the LSD1 uh, inhibitor itself uh, could maybe uh, allow us to do this because we really would like to understand how the inhibitor can revert the macrophage phenotype uh, because it causes killing, so most likely this reversion, which should happen on epigenetic levels, could allow us uh, to maybe go a little bit more into the mechanism and say, well, these epigenetic marks uh, are really important for the survival. Okay, so and then we have a last question from uh, Judy Sakanari, uh, who really liked your talk and uh, would like to know if you think uh, that some of the drugs that are currently uh, used affect methylation, and thus uh, posaconosol uh, have a hypermethylation effect? So the second part of the question, I really don't know. I uh, have no idea. However, the first part of the question is, it's a quite an interesting possibility because some of uh, the currently used drugs is clearly a host component. So uh, uh, antimony, for example, treatment has been shown to boost uh, the, the, the innate immune capacity of the macrophage. And so no one really was looking at the epigenetic impact of these generic inhibitors of Leishmania or drugs. Uh, uh, that's definitely something that uh, one could follow up. Okay, so thank you, Gérard, for this great talk. Uh, I would like you to end uh, sharing the screen. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, I would like to introduce the last speaker of this session, who is uh, Robin uh, Kaki from uh, UCSF, uh, the Department of Cellular Molecular Pharmacology, who will talk about uh, cross-linking mass spectrometry pipeline for the study of host pathogen interactions. 
So Robin, I think uh, it's, your talk is already there. Let and me. You're ready to go. Is that, okay. Uh, okay, hi, thanks everybody for sticking with it till the end. Um, so I think as everyone is um, aware, the Krogan Lab, we use a systems biology approach to study disease and we actually study a large variety of diseases using a combination of these proteomic and genomic uh, approaches. And um, what I think is really powerful about the techniques we use is that we can move from network to function and structure and combine and integrate all of this data in order to get a more complete um, understanding of a complex system, a pathogen, uh, some form of the disease. And today I'm mostly going to talk to you about how we use um, proteomics to study protein structure and protein networks, specifically looking at chlamydia proteins, chlamydia inclusion proteins. And this was a collaboration with the Ingle lab um, and specifically a graduate student in Joanne's lab, Jessica Sherry. Um, and so Joanne had talked a little bit about our collaboration and I'm going to talk a little bit further about a specific protein complex. And since Joanne kind of gave a really good introduction already, I won't go too far into detail, especially since it's not my um, area of expertise. But the important part here is that during infection, chlamydia forms this inclusion body and um, basically has these uh, inclusion uh, integral membrane proteins or inclusion proteins that basically stick out from the inclusion membrane and are how the pathogen basically accomplishes all the things it needs to do in the cell. So how it traffics, how it blocks isosomal destruction, and how it hijacks nutrients from the cell. Um, and so we're really interested in understanding kind of what these inclusion proteins are doing in the cell in order to accomplish all the things that the chlamydia pathogen needs to accomplish to be um, infectious. Um, and so in uh, a collaboration between our two labs, we had done uh, an APMS, a global APMS study, to take the inclusion proteins, to express them individually inside cells, um, and pull down on them in order to identify the host proteins that interact with those inclusion proteins from chlamydia. And Joanne had talked to you a little bit about the INC-E project, and today I'm gonna to talk about the CT192 inclusion protein and its interaction with the host inactin complex. So just to kind of like zoom in and give everyone a reminder, the dynactin complex uh, is an adapter to the dynine motor protein, uh, which is responsible for retrograde uh, transport. And so one of the thoughts, uh, given what we know about chlamydia, is that we know that it does have this like retrograde um, trafficking, is that maybe this interaction between CT192 and the dynactin complex is responsible for retrograde transport. Um, and it actually turned out that this wasn't the case. So if you delete CT192 from the pathogen, it can still uh, do retrograde uh, transport uh, or trafficking. And so um, one of the other ideas was that, you know that dynactin is, can also be part of the mitre, um, centrosomes or um, mito, uh, uh, MTOCs. And so when we overexpress CT192, um, and this is all work from Jess, we can see that it co-localizes with um, these microtubule organizing centers or the centrosomes inside cells. And so one thought was, okay, maybe it's not necessary for trafficking, but for something to do with MTOCs. Um, and in fact, when Jess knocks out CT192 from chlamydia, um, we can actually see that there is a, a defect in relation to the MTOCs. And so in wild type chlamydia, if you um, look at the inclusions, you can see that the centrosomes are all, they co-localize to the inclusion membrane. If you knock out CT192, uh, they actually no longer co-localize with the inclusion membrane. And you can rescue this by adding CT192 um, back into the, the chlamydia pathogen. And here's just to show you that this is um, statistically significant. And so we end up having kind of this unique 
phenotype of CT192 where if you delete it, there's some defect to the progeny production. And specifically, there's this kind of mispositioning of the inclusion with the um, MTOCs and centrosomes. And so that kind of gives us these outstanding questions of during infection, um, what dynactin complex is interacting with CT192? Um, and then what is the structure of this functional dynactin complex? And this is kind of where I come in. Um, and Julia had gave a really great introduction to cross-linking, so I'm not going to kind of belabor the point so much, except to say that there are a bunch of different types of cross-linking methods that you can choose. Um, the generic method kind of follows this path right here where you have your target, so your protein of interest, your complex of interest, your cell or tissue, you cross-link it, you harvest the protein and digest into peptides, uh, and then these peptides are analyzed by mass spectrometry, which is then used for either structural network modeling. And um, uh, I, I will note that uh, I use a slightly different method than Julia, and I'll kind of touch on why we're using that method here. So in a standard um, mass spec uh, experiment, you have your protein sample, you digest it down to peptides, and then inside the mass spec, peptide ions are isolated, they go into a collision cell, you hit them with a bunch of energy, and they break apart, and they form these sequence ions, which we read in the mass spec. Um, with a crosslink sample, it's very much the same, except you have a crosslink sample and it forms this complex mixture of unmodified and modified peptides. And if you don't have um, kind of the really elegant enrichment protocol that Julia was talking about, you mainly get unmodified peptides, so non-crosslink peptides. And in fact, the most informative species of peptide, which are these interlinked peptides, are the lowest abundance. So um, uh, yeah, so when it goes into the mass spec, then you have these interlinked species, if you can isolate them and sequence them, you then get this really complex mixture spectra that has both peptide sequences um, and including the peptide sequences that are linked together. And so this kind of brings up the two challenges of cross-linking mass spec. One is that your interlinked species are going to be low abundance. And when you sequence them, you have this really complex spectra. Um, there are a lot of ways to try to um, still analyze this data, and there are a lot of software algorithms that are now available that are specialized at um, handling this type of spectra. Um, but there's also a different sample preparation strategies that can get around this, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. So we use an MS cleavable uh, crosslinker called disexinamidyl sulfoxide, or DSSO. Um, and what's nice about this is that it has this sulfoxide cleavable site, which is a, um, MS labile. And basically what this lets us do is in the first round of mass spec, we have our intact parent ion like we normally would have, but we can actually isolate it and hit it with just the right amount of low energy. So it just splits the crosslinker in half. And then we can sequence these two uh, peptides separately. Um, and this actually gives us kind of multiple lines of evidence that we have a crosslink peptide and high confidence in what that crosslink peptide is. Um, and in this particular project, we had two strategies. Um, and the first strategy, we have ectopic expression of CT192, um, and where we're pulling down and then crosslinking after pull down. And what we can do here is we can actually identify what's being pulled down with our CT192 complex. Um, and verify that, in fact, we are getting mainly dynactin proteins that are pulling down very specifically. And then we can look at the LCMS3 method and identify which species are actually interacting with each other and directly contact each other. Um, and what's nice about this is that there is a dynactin complex, so, uh, di excuse me, dynactin structure, and we can map these crosslinks back to the dynactin structure. Um, and most of our crosslinks are, in fact, uh, within the expected distance of DSSO. And if we then map CT192, we can actually place where CT192 is on this structure. Um, and we can take a look at kind of where it is. And you can see that it's kind of along this filament. But what I will note is that even though we can place CT192 on this structure, most of where CT192 is crosslinked to is actually missing. So it's not, um, it's mostly cross-linked to dynactin components and those dynactin components are um, apparently really hard to purify and weren't part of this structure. And so what we're hoping to do is then 
pull in our collaborators in the Shelley lab, specifically Ignacia, um, to do some integrative modeling. Um, and what we're hoping to do is CT192 is actually really good at purifying dynactin. Uh, and it gets a really pure complex. So we're hoping to also see if this is amenable to cryo-EM. So pulling down on the dynactin complex using CT192 from chlamydia-infected cells or just from ectopic expression. Um, and then really quick, because I know I'm running out of time, I did want to talk about um, our second strategy, which is actually looking at chlamydia-infected cells. So the chlamydia is expressing CT192 that is flag-tagged. And so we're going to cross-link inside infected cells, pull down on the CT192 using that flag tag, and then identify the network and the structure that's um, interacting. And this is still a work in progress, but I do want to show that we can actually cross-link uh, this complex inside chlamydia-infected cells. And this is just, um, I'm actually using a different cross-linker this time. It's still CID cleavable, but this one has an alkyne tag um, for potential enrichment strategies later. And then this is to show that we actually can purify this complex um, and that the dynactin is in fact cross-linking to the CT192 and is being pulled down with it. And so the next steps are to do uh, the cross-linking mass spec on a larger scale. And so uh, hopefully I didn't go too fast or too far over time, but I did want to say that uh, to summarize, uh, I hope I've shown you that we can go from network to function and then to structure um, and, and basically kind of integrate all of this data together in order to generate a more complete picture of what these host pathogen interactions are doing inside cells. Um, and I want to acknowledge everyone in the Krogan lab um, who have been incredibly helpful. This is kind of our last lab picture that was taken before the pandemic. Um, and then a special thanks to the entire Mass Spec team um, especially Joanne and Jessica, who have done uh, a lot of the work on this, and then the Huang Lab, who's uh, yeah, graciously provided us with some of the software we use for analysis. Um, and with that, I will take any questions. If there are. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Robin. So uh, please uh, type your questions uh, in the Q&A box or for the panelists in the chat box. I go ahead with a question. Uh, looking at some of uh, the function of CT192, uh, um, I was wondering, uh, you, you looked at the cell culture cells, so there, there is a link between the centromere and the primary cilia. Uh, did, you, did you investigate that? Uh, if there's an effect on the on the primary cilia uh, through this uh, chlamydia effector, well, I mean, um, I'm happy to answer that question. Yeah, I was gonna say I didn't do okay. that, but yeah, if Joanne wants <laughs> so, to take that great question, question. Um, there are a number of um, ink interacting proteins in chlamydia that uh, have um, associations with the primary cilium, and that's actually something we are uh, currently addressing. Okay. Thank you. So I'm still waiting for some questions. So I ask a mass, mass spec uh, question with a, with a cross-linking approach, uh, because we also heard about BioID uh, earlier this session. And uh, I mean, so there's all these complementarities. A lot of uh, the interactions during the infection are, are temporary. So I was wondering uh, with your cross-linking approach, uh, like, uh, uh, how how does uh, yeah how does that affect uh, this this dynamics uh, uh, that you you get during the infection? Yeah, so um, a lot of uh, a lot of the time we use cross-linking mass spec to study transient interactors. So um, the the goal would be at least for us during the infection is to capture those transient interactions. So inside cells, the crosslinker is going to kind of act like a glue and hopefully capture things that are have a, ha a fast on-off rate. Um, I will note that the crosslinker I'm using for structural studies is a little bit slower reactive than something like formaldehyde. So um, it should still capture transient interactors, but that's something to keep in mind. Uh, if you're kind of looking just for protein IDs, you might want to use a Sir okay, so I, I have a question from uh, Julia Shamoruki from uh, Pasteur. 
who appreciated your talk very much. And uh, she, she's wondering uh, why, why you have only 50% of your crosslinks uh, that I actually yes. mapped. So the other crosslinks actually map to part of the structure that just isn't in the structure. So dynactin, for whatever reason, when they purified the complex, um, is either too flexible or it, it just was too, trend, like it didn't have a good structure. So most of the dynactin complex is actually missing from the structure. So I did show um, in blue that dynactin is kind of on top. That's like a really tiny fraction of all of the dynactin in that complex. So most of where my crosslinks are are actually to missing density. Um, and that's why we're kind of hoping that we can use CT192 to just purify the dynactin part, which is where most of CT192 is interacting with, and try to use it as a probe to get a better dynactin complex structure. Thank you. So I have a question from uh, uh, Jean, uh, who asks, can you expound on the ability of your XL agents in vivo rather than with the purified proteins? And uh, she also wonders, do you think that CT192 stabilizes the dynactin complex? Yeah, so uh, the cross-linking compounds that I use are um, fairly small. So they um, get across the at least mammalian cell membranes. Um, we've seen uh, with Jess that we can definitely cross-link CT192. So we're, at, at the very least, the protein that we're interested in is definitely getting cross-linked. Um, so we're, we're pretty confident in our ability to cross-link in the chlamydia infected cells, uh, that I think the benefit of doing, um, cross-linking in infected cells is that the whole system is together. Um, when we ectopically express the CT192, it does look different than in chlamydia infected cells. So hopefully we'll be pulling out the more functionally relevant complex. Um, and in terms of whether I think CT192 is stabilizing the dynactin complex, I'm not sure if it's necessarily stabilizing dynactin itself, but what I think is happening is that it's pulling on a specific dynactin complex, um, and perhaps that's being stabilized, um, if that makes sense. Okay. So if there's no more questions, I would like to thank uh, the four speakers uh, for these great talks. Uh, I mean, that shows greatly the uh, complementarity between the work going on in San Francisco and in Paris. And I think uh, through all these sessions, uh, there's a, a lot of food for thought uh, for further discussions tomorrow uh, about collaborative projects. With this, I would like to close the session and uh, I would like to hand over to the organizers. Uh, to say a few words uh, to close uh, this meeting. I'm happy to jump in and have others as well uh, say a few words after. I just want, on behalf of the co-organizers, Carmen and, and Julia, Gerald, Shree, and myself, I'd like to thank everybody for a couple of fantastic uh, days of, of science. Um, just as Joseph was saying, I, it, it's amazing how synergistic the science is at UBI and, and the Pasteur Institute. And um, I look forward to tomorrow, starting at 9 PST, um, for a discussion. We're going to have a breakout discussion on three areas, um, host pathogen interactions, technology, and then clinical applications. And um, we'll have more information right at 9. That's for the PIs to continue the discussion on how we can con continue to work together and strategize also with um, how we can get funding to uh, push these projects you've heard about over the last two days forward as well as new projects as well and i just also just want to end by thanking the the people at qbi that, that organized all of this jacqueline fabius gina win alexa record and carolina Lindsay. so th thanks to that crew this goes super seamless and it's because we have this great crew uh that make it uh look very seamless so i i'm happy to hand it over to uh the other organizers if they wanted to say a few words as well no, just maybe from the Paris side, of course, uh, I think that uh, sitting together with you guys the last two days and tomorrow as well is already a sign of a really very uh, fruitful collaboration between both institutes. Um, 
not so sure how it's going to work out tomorrow evening with this breakout sessions. I, I saw that with just 22 people. So, you know, maybe if we split in three sessions, there will be five to seven people per session, if at all. So it's going to be uh, maybe to be discussed tomorrow. We should all come together and just discuss what we want to do. Uh, well, I want to thank, uh, of course, the colleagues in Paris. Uh, I think I would like to mention maybe Carmen and Julia, because your assistants were involved in the organization. So I would really uh, to extend my thanks uh, to Julia and Carmen and to their assistants as well, which were really, really very helpful. So maybe Julia and Carmen, if you want to just chip in something. I think yeah. you said what you should say, but it's true. Yes, my, my secretary worked a lot in this and so it's really, but with the help of Jacqueline and Gina, it was quite easy. Yes. <laughs> and I don't know, somebody else, I'm sorry if I said, but somebody forgot somebody in, in, the, in San Francisco. Yeah, I also wanted to say that it would have been great to have you here, but it's very nice to see that we can organize this kind of meeting with this high level, even remotely. So I think it's really great, the discussions, and even if it's different, of course, than having things in person. And also, yes, thanking Gina and the whole team because they did a fantastic work with sending all the emails to everyone, speakers, and it went really smoothly for everyone. So thanks to everyone, the, the QBI uh, team, and also, of course, the, the pastor team and everybody, all the speakers here and, and there. Yes, thank you. Thanks to everyone who attended. Shri, did you want to say, add something or are you? Yeah, I, a big thanks to Nevan for his vision in bringing the two institutes together. Uh, I, I'm also very thankful to all the other organizers, especially our counterparts in Pastor, uh, Gerald, Carmen, and Julia. Uh, and a big thank you to all the speakers for staying on time and presenting really exciting and cutting edge research. Um, I can't think of many other symposiums that would cover such broad ranging topics like from uh, global proteomics, cryo-EM, crystallographic, quick chemistry to visualizing small RNAs. And uh, we covered drug discovery and a, lot, a broad a range of topics from viruses, bacteria, and parasites. And I think this gives us a perfect platform for tomorrow's discussion panel. Um, I learned a lot in the last two days and I hope you enjoyed it too. Um, and like everyone, I was uh, very disappointed in not being able to go to Paris in person and visiting the Pasteur. Um, I even had thoughts of how to take the perfect Eiffel Tower photo, but hopefully soon we'll visit and make that dream a reality. So stay safe everyone and good luck in all your future endeavors. Thank you. And talk to you tomorrow. Yeah. And, and the third the third one will be in Paris. You guys aren't off the hook. This isn't an official. You know. <laughs> yes, not for sure. No, we want to organize it. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll we'll be more strict in the future. We won't let people from Berkeley slide into this uh, symposium. So <laughs> 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 Okay. Th thanks everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. Okay. See you tomorrow. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye. Bye.